all you have to do to never binge again is never binge again. You, you don't have to sit by the river and meditate for years. You don't have to smack yourself on the head with a spatula. All you need to do to never binge again is never binge again. Just, just simplify this. Um, Hello and welcome to the Weight Free Wellness Podcast. I'm Tara Bachlin, the creator of the Weight Free Wellness Podcast platform. And my guest today is Dr. Glenn Livingston. He is a psychologist and an entrepreneur. And today he is discussing his book, Never Binge Again, which is based in personal and professional experience. And as I was listening to him and also reading the book, it occurred to me that Body typing has a lot to do with this kind of habit as well. I teach body typing as a way to understand the foods, exercises, and habits that help, can help each body type feel more balanced. And it definitely correlates here. And I would say that especially for the earth types and the fire types are the ones that are more likely to be the binge eaters. Earth types more because of emotional reasons and fire types more because of stress and stressors. So that's something to really check out. You know, if you know that binging is an issue for you, check out the body typing quiz at weightfreewellness.com and see if that rings true for you. I'd be really curious to get some confirmation on that as well. So here you go. It's a really insightful podcast, and Dr. Glenn does present some very helpful tips for you as well. Here you go. Enjoy. Well, Dr. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. I was looking forward to it all week. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. You know, I'm really glad that you contacted me because um, eating and uh, food, dieting and so forth is is and is not a big topic on weight free wellness and it is because it's is a part of my background as far as having been overweight having had eating disorder issues and the title of weight free wellness is actually um, to get people to think that it doesn't have to all be all about weight um, and you don't have to have that weight on your shoulders and I think that your message really lines up that um, it is simpler than than it seems it's a lot simpler than it seems. And I, I think, Tara, that it's particularly important that people become less weight focused because the, I think there's an evolutionary mechanism in our brain which says if calories and nutrition are not available for a period of time, then when they are available, we have to hoard them. And most people have had the experience of their bodies almost forcing them to overcome their best laid dietary and nutritional plans. Um, and, and I think that's actually a survival mechanism in the brain, which binge eaters in particular have triggered by excessive dieting and, and weight focus. So I think that the whole paradigm of shifting out of the weight loss, and what I typically do with my clients is I work with them to just stop the binging and overeating first. And the weight comes along later on. We make adjustments a month or two down the road. We take away the feelings of powerlessness and helplessness and frustration, show them that they actually can control what they eat. And then we make adjustments down the road to drop a little weight. But that really becomes secondary to finding freedom from this internal pressure um, and all of the uh, food obsession thoughts. A lot of people are, they just feel like their whole life has been overtaken by what am I going to have for dinner? What's, when's the next time I can go, go get a pizza? You know, um, and so I, I think what you're doing here is really sorely needed and, and critical. So I'm glad you're doing it. Well, great. Thank you. It's, it's good to be on the same team too. <laughs> same team. <laughs> go us. Right. Yeah. So um, your background, you're not a nutritionist or, or you, how did you get into this in particular? Well, well um, I'm a psychologist by training. I actually come from a family of 17 psychologists and psychotherapists and counselors and social workers and psychiatrists. And um, you don't really want to be invited for a family dinner because you're you can hear everybody arguing and analyzing each other. And it's, it's not really fun. <laughs> but, um, I, I, um, that's what I wanted to do first and foremost. And originally I was a couples and family therapist, but more importantly, I, I had an eating problem. I, I would have been diagnosed with exercise bulimia, um, I don't believe we had those terms at the time, but as an adolescent and early adult, I discovered I'm, I'm fairly tall. I'm six foot four. I'm reasonably muscular. And if I worked out a lot, I could eat six, seven, 8,000 calories a day, no problem. And I quickly figured out how to count those calories and count my exercise. And, um, and I live to eat and work out. I basically lived to eat and work out and wasted a lot of time during my adolescence and early youth, early, um, early adult to doing that. But when I got older and I got married and I had patience and responsibilities, I, I couldn't find the time to spend 
three hours at the gym anymore. And I found that the food obsession didn't go away. And so I still wanted to eat six or 7,000 calories a day. And I got fatter and fatter and fatter. And, um, and I, more importantly, because being a psychologist was so important to me, and I actually work in fairly high-risk situations. I worked with couples right after having an affair. I worked with suicidal adolescents. Uh, I, was, I was in situations where I really had to have my 100% presence and wherewithal about me in order to concentrate on the patient them better. But I was busy thinking about, well, when can I go to the delicatessen and dislodge my jaw and empty everything in there and when can I get a whole pizza or a box of donuts or and that really bothered me and um, so you know be, being being a psychologist from a psychological family like that I thought if you have a hammer everything looks like a nail mm -hmm. and so I, I went to psychologists to try to solve it um, I don't have kids and I never commuted so I also did a lot of corporate consulting for for big food and some other industries and I knew how to I knew how to organize these big studies and so I funded my own to try to figure out what were the psychological um, forces that could be causing someone like me to have so much trouble with food? Were there particular foods that correlated with particular psychological struggles? We can talk about that if you want to. Um, I found some really interesting things, you know, like, like chocolate, chocolate cravings tend to be associated with loneliness and heartbreak. And since I was a big chocoholic, I kind of dug deep into my background and I talked to my mom and I, figured out that um, when I was about two years old, my dad was in the army, he was a captain. They were terrified he was gonna to go to Vietnam. I'm kind of giving away my age. Um, and my mother's father had gone missing for about nine months and she was horribly overwhelmed. And she just couldn't, she didn't have the wherewithal to hug me and love me and take care of me all the time that I really needed. And so what she did was she had a refrigerator on the floor and she put a bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup in the refrigerator. And I, when I would come crying to her, she would say, go get your Bosco, Glenn. And I would go and I would suck on the chocolate Bosco. <laughs> and and you, you would say, wow, well, that, there it is. There it is right there. That's where it started. But I thought once I knew that, then, well, I could just kind of work on the loneliness in my life and I could, um, I could figure it all out and then I wouldn't have the craving anymore. But it turned out, and this is what happened with my clients as well. Uh, my clients that were struggling with overeating. It turns out that there's this crazy voice in our head. There's this crazy voice in our head that says, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Your mama and your papa, they didn't love you enough. And until you figure out how to bridge that loneliness and fill up your heart, you're just going to have to keep on binging on chocolate. Let's go get us some right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it turns out that it's actually figuring out how to recognize and arrest that crazy voice that is what, for me was curative, um, what really seems to help the other people that I work with also. Um, when, I, when I do talk about this, by the way, I talk about it from the perspective of an educator and a coach. Um, I kind of step out of my psychology license because some of what I have to say is really not in concert with the standards of care in my practice. So at your own risk, everyone, I like, like to be free to say what I want to say. Um, but in the alternative literature, and interrupt me if you want to, but in the alternative literature on addiction, I ran into a guy, named Jack Trimpey, and um, he was talking about the fact that the whole culture is saying you have to love your way out of addiction. You have to love yourself more. And I want you to love yourself more. L loving yourself more is, is a good thing. It was good that I figured that out about what happened with my mom and I. Um, it healed my relationship with her. I feel more compassionate towards myself. I have a more uh, soulful ability to connect with other people because of it, but it didn't help me stop binging. Um, and what, what Trimpey said was that um, basically our neuroanatomy is set up in two parts. There's, there's the lizard brain, the very primitive brain, which evolved first. And I'm paraphrasing horribly here, but the lizard brain, when it sees something in the environment, it says, do I eat it? Do I mate with it? Or do I kill it? Eat, mate, or kill. It doesn't care about relationships. It doesn't care about love. It doesn't care about um, soul or creativity or music or art or your long-term goals or anything like that. It's just eat, mate, or kill. It's the higher brain, the neocortex, the logical brain, where our goals and aspirations and ability to, um, ability to delay gratification for the purpose of accomplishing those things and for consideration of tribe and loved ones and is eat mating or killing going to be beneficial for the tribe and the people that we love and this 
evolved later, millions of years of evolution. It's very important that people understand that the neocortex is superior to the lizard brain because that means we can't inhibit it. That comes later. But the problem is that when, when you have the paradigm that you have to love yourself in, and you're standing in line at Starbucks to pay for your latte, and there's a big hairy chocolate bar on the counter, and you hear this little voice that says, you know, chocolate comes from a cocoa bean, and a cocoa bean grows on a plant, and so chocolate's a vegetable. That's the ticket. And it if, has if, all these antioxidants, they say. <laughs> it's got all these anti <laughs> There's nothing wrong with chocolate, per se. As a little aside, my sister can take two little squares out of her purse. She eats the two little squares. She folds it all back up, and she saves the rest for Saturday. I do not know what's wrong with that woman. I, I, I don't understand. But a lot of people can do that, and that's, that's great. I, I'm not one of those people. I'm a guy who would have three bars and a whole pizza after that to kind of even things out, and then a couple of muffins, and a latte to wash it down. Um, and so for me, if, I, if my paradigm is, oh, my, you know, my lizard brain has a craving, that means I have to love myself more, then what you're doing is you're kind of letting go of all this and you're getting out of the way and then the lizard brain runs roughshod. This is a very strong survival impulse. And this is why people feel like they go unconscious when they, uh, when they go on a binge or they, that all of their best laid plans and goals and dreams kind of go to the wayside. It doesn't matter how much time you spent over the weekend studying that diet book. When you get to Starbucks and there's that chocolate bar on the counter, this just goes boom, uh, because you're trying to love yourself thin. What, what I found was for myself and my clients that you actually needed to cultivate a sense of distaste, a sense of distaste, almost disgust for this, because this is kind of sociopathic if you think about it. This doesn't care about relationships, this doesn't care about society, this cares about eat, mate, or kill, regardless. And so overcoming overeating for me and for my clients was more like capturing and caging a rabid animal than nurturing your inner wounded child back to health. Um, and, and, and so this is a little embarrassing because I'm a very sophisticated psychologist and I've done tens of millions of dollars of consulting and all that for large companies. But here's how I did it. I decided this is my pig. This is my inner pig. Now, before everybody jumps down my throat, you don't have to call it your inner pig. They're all, you can call it your troll. You can call it your inner slacker. You can call it your food demon. Whatever you want to call it, please no more hate mail. <laughs> I, get a lot of hate mail. I call it my inner pig. I, I just do. And, and, and also, um, just for the record, I'm a vegan. I'm very concerned about what happens to real pigs in the world. This is a mental construct, my inner pig. Okay. So this is my inner pig. I'll make a really clear line in the sand. The line could be something like, I will never have chocolate again, or I will only ever eat chocolate again on the weekends. It's got to be a really clear line that 10 people following me around all week would agree whether I followed it or I didn't. And then when I hear a little voice that says, chocolate's a vegetable, that's pig squeal. The chocolate itself is pig slop. I don't eat pig slop and I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And as crude as it sounds, as ridiculous as it sounds for a sophisticated psychologist like me to have done this, that's what worked for me. I, I kept the journal for about seven years doing it. I kind of published it on a whim. I, I edited it into a book really quickly and published it on a whim and it kind of took off. And um. Yeah, so I, I don't eat pig slop and I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And when I hear a craving, that's what I say. And what it does is it gives me those um, extra microseconds of delay to make the right decision. It's kind of like jolts me back up into my upper brain and then I can make the right decision. And it wasn't perfect. There was a lot of modification and experimenting and it um, takes a little while for people to get it. So it's not, it's not perfect, but it, um, it really works. It really works, and it's an unusual, different approach to, to overcoming overeating. Well, I can really see it working. I, I personally don't have a, a binging problem, but having had eating issues in the past, um, I, I can relate from my own experience in that, and that it is uh, ultimately an, a mind over matter aspect. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I can, I can imagine it and seeing it working. And, and later in the book, you do talk about how this concept can be applied in other areas, but you give some references of other areas, like how to address it with, you know, with alcohol or drugs. Um, and you re um, recommend that um, gentleman that you had mentioned before. But it sounds like this has really been a, a lifelong work in a lot of ways. Your, your uh, study that you did with what was it, 40,000 people? There were 40,000, yeah, that was during the days when it was cheap to get people to your website on the internet and <laughs> when I was more flowing with money than I am now. But um, yes, we had 40,000 people and 
we figured out some of those connections like chocolate and loneliness or um or salty crunchy things tend to be associated with people that were stressed at work that, those kinds of things but in, in every case everybody had this crazy inner voice that would say that's right that's exactly what's going on let's go work on this thing at work but in the meantime let's go have more potato chip so let's go have more pasta so um at the time i thought maybe i was going to win a Nobel prize but no no such luck but there was a really high correlation you're saying between these states of being the thoughts and feelings and the types of foods people were craving it was, it was noticeable it was noticeable yeah interesting yeah. um so mine is I love chewy. Like I I choose to eat gluten free, and but I I do miss that chewy factor. Did they have the chewy factor come up? I didn't have a chewy factor come up. No, that, it, the closest thing would be the salty, crunchy snacks. But okay, yeah. In, that's interesting. I had to put myself out there. I was kind of afraid, like what would pop up, <laughs> what might come from that. But had to ask. You're to you're totally psycho. That's all I know. Whew, all right. Well, at least now I have a label, right? Then then, <laughs> then I can do something about it. <laughs> So I, what was interesting in the book, and I really recommend people reading it because you're giving a great summary, but um, the, the writing is very easy to get into and I think really speaks to the parts of the brain that need that need a little shaking, you know, that, like, need, need that talking to, you know, uh -huh. like when, when um, you're a little off track in life, maybe when you're younger and you sit down with someone that... Not, maybe not a parent because that can be a little intimidating, but maybe someone, a loving, caring adult that kind of just said, okay, here, this is what you need. This is what's going on. Um, so I really appreciate how it was written. I'm curious, uh, you did get into this a bit, but what, is, what do you mean by this? It's the survival drive go going wrong, that this urge to binge. What okay. So there was a series of there were a series of studies in the late fifties. I lost your audio, by the way. Are, are you still? Can you hear me now? Or do yeah, you now I can. Now I can. Sure. Okay. Um, there was a series of studies in the late fifties and early sixties by gentlemen, a, a group Milner and Olds, I think they were, and they were done with rats. And I'm not saying these were ethical experiments, but they were done, and they implanted electrodes in the pleasure centers of the rat's brain. And they hooked up those electrodes to a self-stimulating lever. Um, so they allow the rats, in other words, to artificially stimulate themselves and bypass all of the natural mechanisms which would get that center to, to fire. What they found was that the rats would choose that artificial stimulation. They would press the lever thousands of times per day, thousands of times per hour in some cases. And they found it was a stronger, it had a stronger valence than food. The rats would starve themselves in order to press the lever. Um, mother rats would abandon their nursing pups to go press the lever. Rats would cross a painful electrical grid to go press the lever. And, and in other words, what this really demonstrated was that it's possible to artificially stimulate the pleasure center um, and cause animals to engage in, in self-neglect to the extreme in order to do that. Now, there are, I used to do a lot of consulting for big food and, and um, also big pharma, things I'm not necessarily proud of these days. But in my youth, I did that. And what I can tell you is that there's an awful lot of money going, billions and billions of dollars going into research to figure out how to pack as much fat, sugar, salt, excitotoxins, and chemicals that will into a small space that will artificially stimulate your pleasure centers. Um, and hijack your survival drive in the same way that the rat's drives were hijacked. Then there are billions of dollars more that go into packaging it in a way that makes it look healthy and billions of dollars more going into advertising it in a way that makes you think that it is healthy and that you really need it, right? Mm -hmm. And as an example, I think I saw a study that said there are over 7,000 messages about food that are beamed to us every year on the television and radio and internet. And virtually none of them are about fruit and vegetables, right? So from this very, so the, the odds are stacked against us. Oh, and, th and then there's the addiction treatment industry, which promotes a paradigm of powerlessness and loving yourself then, right? They say, you can't quit. You can only abstain one day at a time. Progress, not perfection. Um, there, there is no human defense against certain urges, right? So they're actually, they're actually kind of denying the physiological setup of the brain. There is a human defense. We, we evolved over 
tens of millions of years to have this superior part of our brain to control this part of our brain. There is a human defense. But the, there's all this economic incentive to get you to choose that lever instead of you know, nursing your pups and eating healthy food and engaging in self-care. Um, and that's what I mean by a survival drive. That's, I am so sorry. A survival drive that has been hijacked and, um, and working against you. Now, there's good news here. Um, when you know this, it's a little bit like, remember the movie The Matrix or Morpheus says to Neo, take the red pill or the blue pill? Well, if you take the right pill, and you see what's going on, it's, it's a piercing insight. And you, you kind of can't go back when you actually see what's going on. And if you recognize that it's okay that every bone in your body wants that chocolate bar, if every, every cell in your bill is, is, is screaming for the chocolate bar, that's the experience that the rats had, I'm sure, when they wanted to go press the lever. But you, when you recognize what's happening, you wake up your upper brain and you can say, but you know what, even though every cell in my body wants that, I know that I can retrain my survival drive. Um, beneath your craving for chocolate, I know nobody believes me, you're not supposed to believe me at this point, is a craving for leafy greens or broccoli or an orange or, or you know, something, whatever it is in your healthy paradigm of eating. I'm, I'm a whole foods plant-based guy, so I tend to really believe that. Um, but you can retrain your survival drive um, if you're, willing to kind of step back and intellectually distance yourself from the physiological experience of the craving. You do have power. You are not powerless over this. And when you recognize this, there's this immediate sense of um, hope and excitement and enthusiasm that comes over people. We can talk more specifically about the steps you can take to take control like that. But um, yeah, that, that's the good news. And it doesn't take willpower. This, this, is, this is the thing that people don't quite understand. Um, willpower is a fatigable muscle, right? I mean, there's a really good book called The Willpower Instinct, which documents that as the day goes on, there are only so many good decisions that we can make. Um, and this is why towards the end of the day, you might be good all day. And then at nighttime, you read the refrigerator because you've been making food decision after food decision after food decision. But if as a matter of character, you make a commitment to a set of food decisions that you've made beforehand, then you don't have to make those decisions during the day. I never eat chocolate on a weekday. I will never do that again. Well, I'm not the kind of person who eats chocolate on a weekday. Therefore, if my inner pig says chocolate is a vegetable on a Wednesday, no dice. That's pig squeal. I'm not going to do that. Um, I don't have to make decision after decision. The same way that when you walk into the diner and there's $20 on the table for the waitress, um, you don't have to you don't have to use willpower not to take that $20 because you've made a character decision that you're not a thief. You've made a character decision that you're not the kind of person that would take it away from someone who, who would belong. So even though it would be pleasurable to take it, you could have your own use for that $20. It's, um, there's a very strong impulse to, to gather that, but you don't do that because you're not the kind of person. Um, you're also not the kind of person that robs a bank. You don't have to walk around saying, it's been five days since I robbed a bank. Yay for me. Right. <laughs> um, you're just not the kind of person that does that. You can be the kind of person that doesn't eat this or do that, or you can be the kind of person who always has six servings of fruit and vegetables every day. You can decide what kind of person you want to be as a matter of character. And that's the antidote to big food and um, big advertising and you know, big addiction treatment. That's, that's the antidote that, I, that I've seen anyway. So you, you just kind of finished off on that a little bit um, about that it seems like the odds are stacked against, against us. You talked about food addiction, craving, and then even the industry and advertising. Um, were those the three that we, you named before? I'm yeah. Kind of, I'm surprised by my memory. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> big food, big, big advertising, and big addiction. Yeah. So, yeah, explain that a little bit. How, you know, because it can feel... Well, I've taken control, I would say, over what I, I'm eating. And it's hard to even say that because even in our society, when you say, I've taken control, that can sound very um, domineering and maybe not healthy. But you do have to take control in certain areas of your life. Um, so I'm going to say that. I've taken control over what I choose to eat. Um, <laughs> But I can see as I work with other people too, that, and, and it, it, it feels to them that they just can't win. Right, right. Well, first of all, you have to understand that 
the philosophy of the 12 steps has kind of inculcated our culture. And if you're in the 12 step programs and it's working for you, you might not want to listen to the next part. Um, Cause I, I, the last thing I want to do is ruin your abstinence, ruin your addiction, ruin your, ruin your, your work. Um, so please turn out and come back in five minutes and that'll be okay. And I, or, you know, take notes and write me curses. It's okay. I, I don't want to ruin your, I don't want to ruin your success. Um, however, th there's no evidence that, there's no evidence that addiction is a disease really. What's typically cited as evidence are these brain scans, which show a change in the, um, in the portion of the brain that fires in response to a particular stimuli. But those same changes will be evidenced, um, for example, in taxi drivers. You put taxi drivers in a taxi, they get the same areas of their brain light up as when, you know, when addicts are given alcohol, alcoholics are given alcohol. Um, all that's showing is that is the principle of neuroplasticity, which says that that which fires together, wires together. Our brain is, our brain is set up to find reinforcement where it finds reinforcement and go find it again. And so th there's really, there's no evidence that addiction is a disease. There's no evidence that the, the 12 step programs even work to, create long-term secure abstinence. Um, and as a matter of fact, the only two uh, reasonably scientific studies I could find said that the outcomes were either at parity or worse than doing nothing at all. But it's much more comfortable for a family when they're, this is where it comes from. It comes really from alcoholism and drug addiction. When someone is essentially being um, selfish and engaging in chemical masturbation and spending all of the family's resources and, you know, putting everybody in harm's way and, you know, going out and wrecking the car and everything like that. It's very difficult for the family to look at them and say, you know, this guy is really being a selfish prick. And as a doctor, I know it was really hard for me to say, you know, your, your husband is kind of being a selfish. So sorry. Um, uh, he's, he's being really selfish what you really want to do is have something compassionate to say, well, and so what's kind of taken hold is this idea that he's got a disease. Um, he's not, he's not, um, he's not being selfish. He's got a disease and he's going to go work on the problem and he needs this particular treatment. And, um, and so that notion leads to the idea that people are powerless over their addictions, that they can't take control, that it's not their fault. Um, and, the fear of the shame um, is, is what gets people to go along with that. See, that's, that's exactly what your inner pig wants to hear. When, um, like if, if you're an alcoholic and you walk into a meeting and, and you just are struggling and struggling against this survival drive and they say, well, this is not your fault. You're powerless over this. You don't have to quit. You can only, all you have to do is abstain one day at a time. That's exactly what people want to hear. For some people, very small percent, it works long-term, but there's no evidence that it's better than doing anything at all. Just taking, and most people who, most people who recover, recover of their own accord. So um, that, that notion has overtaken the culture. The notion that we can't control ourselves has overtaken the culture. And it's more appealing than feeling a little bit of shame when you make a mistake. Like, you know, I'm not saying to perseverate on the guilt or perseverate on the shame. It's, it's kind of like if you touch a hot stove by accident, you're supposed to feel that pain for a second. If kids that don't feel pain, they don't live very long because they, you know, they wind up getting themselves in a lot of physical trouble. Um, and there is, there is a disease where people actually don't feel pain and they, they don't live very long at all, usually not past four or five years old. Um, but if you touch a hot stove, feel the pain for a minute, but then you don't say, well, I'm a compulsive hot stove toucher and I'm powerless over touching hot stoves and what's wrong with me? I've got all these defects of character that I can't stop myself from touching hot stoves. No, you just, why don't I touch the hot stove? What do I have to adjust in my life so I don't touch the hot stove again? And then move on with confidence. And, um, you know, like if, if, you were, if you were trying to get better at archery, you would want to see the target with crystal clarity you would want to aim at that target with the totality of your being. And you'd want to purge all the doubt and insecurity from your mind so you had the best chance of hitting the target. If you don't hit the target, you wouldn't take all the rest of the arrows and just shoot them up in the air. Like you would, you would get up again and do the whole thing over again. Being able to say, I will never have chocolate during the week again, that gives me a crystal clear target to aim for. Now, if I make a mistake and I, and I, 
accidentally have chocolate during the week, then I figure out what went wrong. Did my pig say something creative that I wasn't hearing correctly? Did I not define the target well enough? Um, did I just make a conscious choice that I didn't care? And then I look at my motivations. I get up and I make adjustments if I have to, but, and I'll do it again. Um, I often tell people, we have to talk to our inner pigs like a little child. So even though from their perspective, it has to be never. Little Johnny, you can't ever, 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 ever cross the street without holding mommy's hand again. Never, ever, 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 ever. From, that, from their perspective, it has to be like that, even though you know when they are seven or eight years old, you're gonna train them to look both ways and carefully cross the street by themselves, maybe nine. Um, you know what I mean? But, but people are really terrified of these words, never and always, and as a consequence, they make the goals really fuzzy and they're very vulnerable to this whole um, neither here nor there, you know, ad addictive, um, addictive culture, which says you're powerless, you're hopeless, you know, but if you hang out with a lot of other powerless, hopeless people, maybe it'll be okay. You, you point out a number of things that uh, I want to touch on for a moment here that, so in the book, you have like one line and it stood out to me too, where this material and the way that you present it tends to appeal more to men than to women. And in our brief talk beforehand, which I found really fascinating because I said, I enjoyed it. I can see how it would work. Um, but I know I think a little bit differently. I have um, a husband who speaks really directly. He's an entrepreneur also. I know you are as well. And so there's a certain mindset you know, where, uh, you know, you get used to how certain people speak and, and so forth. And I'm an entrepreneur as, as well. So, you, you know, you, you are used to seeing, try, trying to see things clearly, piece things apart, speak as truthfully and indirectly as possible. And that's not necessarily promoted in our society. And so when you say, you know, it's the inner pig, just speaking about that voice or that inner self that may be saying, no, go eat it, go do that, you know, just fill yourself up. Um, that some people don't like that term. So you say, okay, you can use different terms, but then also speaking about the words always or never. And that's really hard to hear. Um, I think the more that you're you're in kind of trapped actually by that inner pig or whatever you want to call it um, doesn't want to hear those words and I think what you're hitting upon and you say go ahead send me hate mail whatever you know we need these truth seekers in our in our society um, because words uh, are are being uh, changed honestly they're being uh -huh. changed and um, as a linguist as well I speak several languages oh. if, if you don't have a clear understanding of the word what the word is where the root comes from what it actually means or if you eradicate a word from your your language soon the culture shifts hmm. and um, I think the assu assumption is that that is a good thing. We want our culture to shift, but then you've taken away the mode of communicating clearly, um, which I'm kind of, as I'm speaking, I'm disseminating a bit from your background, you know, being a clinical psychologist, you you have to use language to communicate and then to um, statistically analyze things. And um, I guess in a way, I'm probably even coming, I feel like I want to come to your defense of saying, okay, hear this guy out. You know, you may not like these words using the pig or never or always, um, but given my own experience, um, I can see this being very valuable in being able to essentially sit yourself down or the pig, as you call it, uh -huh. and say, okay, this is what we're going to do because this is for your own good you know, as you as yourself and, and don't give in to that other, that other self, the pig, the dog, the cat, the cloud, whatever you want to call it, you know, but don't let um, your own feathers getting ruffled up, let you miss the message, let you miss the tools that can be really valuable. And that's a little bit of my own soapbox, you know, from Weight Free Wellness say, you know, let's find the tools. I mean, right now my tagline is shedding light on the many paths to health. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, I see some really valuable tools here that um, it sounds like appeal, appeals to men, which I can see, you know, cause it's, it's a little bit more, even using Chinese medicine terms, a little more young, you know, a little more manly in the words. Um, but sometimes I know we as women also need to hear it straight, you know, just like, okay, this is, 
Well, the, the truth is that 85% of my clients since we published the book with that explanation in it have been women. Tara, yeah. I, just want, I just want to ask, is it possible you could follow me around and give that explanation to everybody as I go and make presentations? Because that, that was just fabulous. I really appreciated that. Well, great. Yeah. We'll refer them to the podcast. At least you'll... Okay. <laughs> but I will... I, like I, I left a comment on um, Amazon after I read the book that I'm going to suggest this or highly or even required of people when I do my um, weight and self image programs um, because it is you do have to face your no matter what it could be um, even career goals or life goals if, if something's not going the way you want it to there are times where you have to sit yourself down and have a stern talk. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, you and I are not making this up. This this is um, a devil and the angel on the shoulder since time immemorial, and right. it's just it's just kind of um, it's kind of a way of getting back to basics of what really used to work for people before the culture shifted and inculcated us with this notion of powerlessness. Before, um, before the by the way, the advertising industry knows that advertising works best when you think it doesn't work. And so everybody walks around saying, well, advertising doesn't have an impact on me, but guess what? They're not spending billions of dollars to not have an impact on you. There are all kinds of ways that they're measuring it. And um, the fact that you don't think it works is part of how it works. And, and, and so, um, so, so, so there are these really horrific forces against us, but when you get back to basics of the way that people used to pursue character the way that they used to manage their impulses it's, it's entirely possible you don't you don't have to buy into all this and you, you don't have to keep pressing that lever just because they're handing it to you that leads to a next question is you know we we know that msg for example is naturally or mostly unnaturally present in food can trigger the brain um and i'm a i'm a believer in in mind over matter in just saying okay i'm going to do this um but what about, well, how do you respond to the aspect of, well, biologically, I'm this way? You know, if someone says, biologically, I I'm, I'm, tend to be this way. Well, we're, we're all wired to biologically respond to these foods. And we all have different preferences for a particular one. Some people like pizza, some people like chocolate, some people like donuts, some people like potato chips. But we're, we're all wired with evolutionary buttons to press this. We're, we're all suffering from these incredible cravings um, on purpose. This is, this is, you know, purposeful manipulation of our, of our cravings and they're hijacking of our survival drive. Um, even if you are wired for that, that doesn't mean that you have to express it, right? It, it doesn't really change the fact that you are also wired to inhibit that impulse and redirect that energy someplace else. Um, I, I'm wired for chocolate. I'm convinced that I'm wired for chocolate. Um, I haven't had it in years, not, not because I go to programs or anything like that, but because of this crazy, crazy technique and because I consciously and purposely redirected that craving towards, you know, green smoothies and chlorophyll and um, bananas and, you know, I, I consciously and purposely said, I respect, I respect that there is something going on if my body is saying that, that I probably do have some realistic, authentic physiological need. And I look for what that physiological need might be in, the, in nature. Um, you know, the craving to smoke cigarettes is a misdirection of the craving for oxygen. And so when someone who is quitting smoking takes a series of very deep breaths, they can inhibit that craving and get themselves back in control because they're providing their body the fresh oxygen that it needs. And so, um, if you are wired more strongly for a particular food than another one, then okay, you have, that's where your energy needs to go, which kind of leads to the practical things that I like to tell people to do if you want me to go in that direction. But I'll pause in case there's someplace else you want me to go. Well, I'm curious, um, is there a withdrawal period that you see that people typically have? Like you just say, do you say, just do it straight for a month, you know, because there's chemical, maybe even chemical addiction and or relearning that taste for, okay, it's not chocolate that I need. I need broccoli. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll learn to like broccoli. It'll take a little while. So I find that after a month or two, when people have, now I don't advocate for everyone to give up everything, right? So a lot of people come to me and they say, well, you know, I want to have 
pretzels at a major league baseball game or I want to have chocolate at social events or I want to have a drink once in a while in X, Y, and Z conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but for the people who give something up, like for example, someone who would give up chocolate, I find after like 28 to 30 days that they're not really bothered nearly as much by the crazy voices in their head saying, you know, chocolate is a vegetable, you have to have this or you're going to die. That, that goes away because of necessity, when you give something up, you have to replace it with something else. So, so and, and the way that the brain is wired, if you're not constantly reinforcing where, you know, where does the good stuff come from, if you're not constantly reinforcing that connection that I have chocolate craving, therefore I eat chocolate, if instead you're reinforcing I have chocolate craving, therefore I have green smoothie, over the course of a month or two, that, that, that crazy voice goes away. Now, now, maybe it'll come up once in a while if there's a particular memory or something like that. Like, like um, you know, like a Doberman pincher in a, in a cage when you, when you get a whiff of a filet mignon or something like that. It might, it might come up for a second. Mm -hmm. But you've had so many experiences by that point of how to, you know, keep the cage shut and, and walk away from it that um, it's not... Our inner pigs tell us it's going to be torture to give something up forever, that life is going to be unlivable, um, that they're going to be so bothered by these mental cravings and physiological cravings that they won't be able to work, they won't be able to concentrate on their loved ones. It's really not the case. It's mm -hmm. really not the case. It, you know, it starts to die down after a few weeks, after a few months, you hardly think about it. Um, I can't remember the last time I've had a chocolate craving. I, I honestly can't. Well, you, in the book, you gave a good example of this, of when you would go um, hiking in the mountains and initially you would do it with loaded with junk food. And then your first time having whole foods, how it was a completely different experience. Why don't you share a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, first of all, I got that idea from Jeanine Roth, um, who's a very powerful author in the emotional leading space. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I call this the deprivation trap. And our pigs will say that, if we don't have chocolate, we're going to be horribly deprived. It'll focus all on the, on the immediate deprivation, the immediate effect. But sometimes I will say, well, let's put that aside. I'll ask people, let's put that aside. And imagine you didn't have chocolate for a year. What would be different in your life? Now, in the case of someone like me, chocolate was really the trigger for everything else. So when I thought about not having chocolate, I thought, well, at that time I was like 260 pounds. Now I'm about 200. I thought I'll get down to I'll get down to 200 pounds finally, and I'll, I won't have to worry about my triglycerides, and I'll have more energy. I'll be able to enjoy the mountains more. Um, and I'd never really experienced what it was like to go hiking without a big bag of junk food. I don't, I had only, I, in fact, up until that point, I might have only gone hiking because I thought, well, then I could burn off, you know, 7,000 calories at the top of the mountain if I wanted to. Um, but when I finally got away from chocolate, what I didn't realize was that the pig was depriving me of that whole experience of nature. Like I was actually really present and I could feel the cool, crisp mountain air and I could look at the view and, um, you know, I could experience the streams and the animals and the sounds and the scents. And, you know, I felt so much more fully alive. And at that moment, I realized my pig has been depriving me of this all these years just for the taste and convenience of that immediate high. They wanted me to get high with chocolate. And um, so that's the deprivation trap. And I encourage people to really think about if they made a crystal clear rule for themselves and they could comply with it. I know their pig says it's impossible, but if you could comply with it, what's everything that's going to change in your life one year from now? And, um, you know, and then you'll really see what you're going to be deprived of if you let the pig continue to, to dominate. Now then you can make a decision. Like I, I would fight for your liberty um, we fought wars in this country for liberty, and I would fight for your liberty to live fast and die young if you want to do that. It's, it's your prerogative. It's part of a free society. But I would fight even harder to have you make that choice in a fully informed state. And our pigs keep us from being fully informed by never presenting the other side of the deprivation trap. So yeah, that's what I meant by that, yeah. It's a great example because I find even in my life, um, so in my early 20s, I was very unhealthy um, and fortunately realized that pretty early. And so I would want to exercise and do things, but I felt horrible. And I looked fairly pretty normal other than having really dry skin and, and not feeling that great. Um, you know, someone wouldn't point at me on the street and say, wow, she's in really bad shape or anything, but I could feel it myself. And once, you know, at first it can be so challenging to, to take out certain foods. You know, I, um, 
before I met my husband, I never really drank water. It was like milk or juice or pop. And, and so um, I, w- I was working out and he was, he was actually my martial arts instructor at the time. And I was like, why do I feel so bad when I'm doing this? And he's like, well, what did you have to eat before you came here? And I told him and he's like, well, it was a ham sandwich and uh, well, a sandwich, obviously, on bread with mustard. And it's so funny. This is such a joke between us. And then it was an iceberg salad with, you know, the the Italian dressing you get at the at the store. And he's like, well, that's why, you know, the, the pork takes so much to digest. And, and you're literally just consuming water in, in the iceberg lettuce. And that's the only water you're giving your body. No wonder you feel horrible. And what what so that's why it, I actually had to force myself to go exercise because it was painful. It, I wanted to throw up. My body just ate. And I was, I was 18 at the time. I say I feel better in my mid-30s than I did when I was 18. And that's because, and, and now I enjoy exercising. I enjoy eating good foods because I feel good during it is is that after effect that you're talking about you know actually breathing the mountain air and experiencing life at, in all the beautiful ways it's meant to be experienced and not just clouded by the smells of chemicals and the, the effects of chemicals right. in your body right right and it's it's amazing how quickly that overtakes things when you start to give yourself that experience yeah, yeah. definitely hey, there's a little trick by the way mm-hmm. um, one of the easiest first things to do and I have to give a disclaimer that I'm not a medical doctor or a dietitian or anything like that. Um, so if there's any reason you can't do this physically, then don't do it. But I don't know many doctors that would prevent their clients from having leafy green vegetables. And if you just start to add more leafy greens, maybe even after you binged as a way to help you recover, you know, pick a big handful of leafy green vegetables, put them in the blender with a little bit of water and drink it down. And then try to take two handfuls and, and just every now and then add some of that that cues your survival drive into what it really needs and you'll start to make adjustments and and you'll you'll actually find that you're less frightened after a binge when you do that because part of what happens in a binge is you have all these calories and salt and sugar and fat and oil and and excitotoxins and your body didn't, even with all those calories, it didn't actually get what it needed. So there's this continued craving, but because that craving is now associated with all these artificial foods, you're craving more of the artificial foods. And if you just take a moment and put some of those leafy greens in, your body goes, ah, it just goes, okay, that's what I need. And the, the cravings die down just a little bit and mm-hmm. you feel just a little less frightened. So that's, that's, I find, a really simple way of moving the survival drive back towards where it needs to be without getting all freaked out about, I have to give up this, I have to give up that. Yeah, that's a great tip. I, I think I've intuitively done that when I've maybe had a, a meal that was, or something that wasn't so healthy. I would, I'll take a, a handful of chlorella tablets. Yeah. At least in your mind, you're like, okay, I even that out a little bit. So <laughs> maybe I'll say for myself, but yeah. hey, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt or at least, yeah. Non-medical advice doesn't hurt me. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I w- would you talk a little bit, you mentioned in the book, comfort versus contentment. Well, um, the bags and boxes and containers of artificial pleasure that are available in the world today didn't exist on the Savannah. They didn't exist as we were evolving. Um, you know, you couldn't get a chocolate bar in the Savannah. You, you just couldn't. And so it's important to recognize that what's happened is almost like we've had wires inserted into our pleasure centers and we've been given these levers um, to get high with food. See, a lot of people talk about food being comfort. Well, it can be because when, when you're emotionally upset and you overeating these things, the nervous system has more difficulty conducting the emotions. That's true. So there is a kind of anesthesia, but it's not just that. There, uh, like in chocolate, there's the overmean and all these other stimulants. And um, it, we really are altering our brain chemistry with these foods, um, you know, in concentrated starches. There are opioid, opioid, opioid substances, opioid-like substances in grains and refined grains that um, stimulate our pleasure centers and get us, get us addicted. We're actually looking to get high with food. We're actually looking to get high with food. And it's important to have that perspective so that you're 
not going all poor baby to the to the pig so that you really are making it dystonic and uncomfortable to continue to indulge. Um, and it's the so, so what I tell people is that like when I when I'm craving chocolate, for example, or when I used to crave chocolate, when I would have a leafy green smoothie with a whole bunch of bananas and cinnamon and vanilla, um, I wouldn't get the same high that I did from eating the chocolate but the craving would go away and I would feel contempt. And it was a much more even keeled type of consistent energy that was sustainable as opposed to the high you're going to get with a drug, which then drops, which you have to chase with more drugs, which then really destabilizes your whole life. So I try to tell people, look, you, you're, you're never going to get the same high that you do with these bags and boxes and containers. It's, it's just not going to happen. But you don't have to be bothered with all these cravings. You can trade that for a much more content, even killed, consistent energy that allows you to pursue your hopes and dreams and goals in life with much more, much more zeal. Without yeah. constantly blowing up your opportunities and, you know, having to spend days recovering from, from a binge. Yeah, it's, it's really rewarding, you know, to feel in control of your life in that way. Yeah. So I have a couple more questions for you. Um, well, before the closing question, describe to us how you feel now compared to before when you were binging. I feel hopeful and enthusiastic about life. I'm um, excited about all that I'm accomplishing. I feel that I'm more present in my relationships. I feel like I'm... Um, for like the second half of my life. I, sometimes I feel sad that I wasted 30 years looking at all those other crazy excuses because really my life during that time was mostly about food, honestly. When I, when I look back on it, I, I, waste, I accomplished a lot of things because I'm kind of a smart guy and I didn't have kids and I didn't commute and I had a lot of fortunate circumstances that made the right introductions and allowed me to spend a lot of time working. Um, but I, I could have I done a lot more. I could have done a lot more. I could have helped a lot more people. And I'm, I'm just thrilled at the direction that my life is taking to be able to, to help people now. And, um, you know, the relationships that are so much different and how I feel in my body. Like I'm not carrying around an extra 60 pounds. I don't have to worry about dying of a heart attack. Um, you know, I, every man in my family has had a heart attack up until this point besides me. So it, it's on my, on my mother's side. Every man in the family has had, had a heart attack. So, so you know, it's it's not even a comparison. It's not even a valid comparison. It's, it's, um, it's a whole different life. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for asking. So there are a lot of points that we didn't cover in the book because they're there. I, I think what you recommend in the book is true. You know, instead of just telling a friend, I learned this new great thing. You got to try it. I've, I've run into this before where, um, the book really explains itself. You need to go through the process. It's one of those things. Um, and so I purposefully didn't include a lot of stuff from the book. wanted to even talk about even the results and so forth, because I, I want to highly encourage anyone listening to this, especially if they're still listening to this point, read the book and you'll really understand the principles a lot better. Um, so I, I really wanted to get that uh, across because um, it's kind of like explaining an experience that, you know, like explaining flying and the person has never been flying before. You know, you kind of you have to go through it um, yeah. and you don't want to scare them either. You're like, you're way up in the sky and you can't see the ground, you know, and you don't want to. This, this is also kind of an, that's all true what you're saying. And this is an odd book to try to spread by word of mouth. You say, well, listen, you've got a pig inside of you and, you know, that, that thing over there that you're craving, that's pig slop and you don't have to eat pigs. It's, I mean, people do it, but they get a lot of bad reactions sometimes. So I, I tell them to just, um, you know, they, the book is free for the Kindle or the Nook and I tell them how to get that and um, just refer to their friends like that. Yeah, it's so yeah. conveniently available. So um, there's no problem there. Uh, so share with us a few closing points, a few closing messages that you would really like listeners to go away with. Well, the first thing is to try to find your single worst food trigger or eating behavior and just focus on making one rule for that. Maybe it's a never rule, maybe it's an always rule, maybe it's a conditional rule. Um, but, but focus on just one so you can see how this game is played. And then once you articulate that in writing, listen carefully for your inner pig or whatever else you want to call it. 
listen carefully for that. And get up in the morning and ask your inner pig for all the reasons that it has to break that rule today. So you can kind of take the offensive and, um, and, and prepare yourself for what your inner pig is thinking. And that, that's the best way to just kind of get a start on this. I would say all you have to do to never binge again is never binge again. You, you don't have to sit by the river and meditate for years. You don't have to smack yourself on the head with a spatula. All you need to do to never binge again is never binge again. Just, just simplify this. Um, if, if you want to go to therapy for other reasons, I'm all for that. Um, if you like the programs you're going to, then keep going to the programs. But, but all you need to do to never binge again is never binge again. So just kind of cut through the, the nonsense. Um, and the last thing when you're ready is to just have to tell people where, um, you know, that we've talked about it a lot in theory and we both get kind of excited and up on a soapbox, but the best way to learn it is to listen to people who have actually done it. And um, I recorded a whole bunch of sessions that they can, they can hear. I've got some food plan starter templates and I can link them to a place where they can get the Kindle, the Nook or a PDF for, for free if they want to, just to get them started. So whenever you're ready, we can do that. But if you have more questions, then let's do that first. No, that's great. Um, I'll definitely have links and stuff in the show notes, but um, where can people get, you have a really a great list of materials for people to, to make it easier to get into this. So what are those materials? How can we- well, it's, it's easy. Just go to neverbingeagain.com, neverbingeagain.com and click on the big red button to get the free reader bonuses. And when you sign up for that, you'll get everything you need. Yeah. Like you said, you have great worksheets, um, uh, uh, audio pieces. And I think what's probably going to be most helpful, sounds most helpful is, you know, uh, you talk about the pig, you know, that, that voice on the shoulder saying, do it, do it, do it. You have all a huge list, all kinds of resources to help people to, to come back at that voice, you yep. know, to not succumb. And um, I see that being really, really, really valuable. A lot of times it's just a matter of hearing it. A lot of times it's just a matter of being willing to separate your constructive thoughts from your destructive thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I find that when people step back and they listen to the destructive thoughts, they just seem silly. They just Mm -hmm. seem silly. But the problem is they weren't hearing it before. Well, I really appreciated the read um, and I can see it applying to other areas of life and definitely look forward to, to experimenting a bit more with that too. Tara, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to the Weight Free Wellness Podcast. You can find full show notes at weightfreewellness.com. Look for episode number 70, and you'll find links there for Dr. Glenn's very helpful resources, as well as other resources mentioned in the podcast. And as always, if you haven't connected yet on social media, seek us out. We're on all kinds of platforms, and we love hearing from you. And there you'll also get the latest in hearing when podcasts are up and new announcements and so forth. Let us know what you're liking what you'd like to hear more of if you have constructive criticism we appreciate that as well and if you're really enjoying these podcasts we would so appreciate if you leave a review on itunes or on facebook just letting other people know that this is a very worthwhile resource for health and wellness information and you know it helps us to feel good as well thank you so much have a great day bye-bye